right, right now. now we are so obsessed with being right mm -hmm. that we forget that we really just want to be better. I will trade being right for living in a place that I can be proud of. This is the Techsploder podcast, conversations with tech professionals about being human in a binary world. Episode 10, Father Robert Balasser. Techsploder is made possible by the financial support of our patrons, like Larry Bailey. Thank you, Larry. If you like what you hear, head on over to patreon.com slash Jason Howell, like Larry did, and you can support the show directly. And thank you for making independent podcasting possible. Hello and welcome to the Techsploder podcast. I'm your host, Jason Howell, and this week, I've got a very special guest. It's Father Robert Balasser, a good friend of mine, also known as the Digital Jesuit. Father Robert is a Catholic priest, as well as a tech expert, content creator, and podcaster. He keeps himself very busy. From building computers as a teenager to setting up studios at the Vatican in Rome, Italy, Father Robert Balasser has really dedicated his life's work to the fusion of his faith work in the church and his passion for technology. Now, Father Robert was also a host on the twit.tv podcast network, along with me, for a number of years before actually moving to Rome to work for the Jesuit Curia, where he resides today. Now, I just got back from our family vacation through Italy just a handful of days ago, still kind of battling a little bit of the jet lag. And Father Robert Balasser is a primary reason why we went in the first place. We actually stayed at the Vatican housing during our time in Rome. And while we were there, I had the pleasure of chatting with Padre in his production studio for this episode. So here it is. We started things off talking about travel, specifically Washington, D.C., where we had just traveled from a few days prior. Um, so let's drop right in my conversation with a good friend, Father Robert Balasser. My favorite museum in um, in DC is the Air and Space, not the one on the oh. mall, not the one on the mall, the the Heze Udar or Uz Ude, what something. It, it's named after a famous guy. It's near IAD Airport. Okay, that thing is incredible because it's it's got a space shuttle, it's got the SR seventy one, it's got basically every plane. It's it's the it makes the one on the mall look like a Best Buy. <laughs> it's, it's like, uh, little, little samples. Yeah. You know, but, it's, but it's nice. I, I, I mean, I kind of miss living in DC. I did not think yeah. I was going to like it. When I, when I was sent to DC, I was like, okay, well, mission. This is what when, we do. When we'll were you DC. sent to DC? 2009. So I was there from 2009 to 2013, which by the way, oh, okay. that's when I started interacting with you <laughs> because I, it was a, it was a 30 minute walk to and from the office every day. Yeah. And so what I had on my, uh, on my, it actually, it wasn't a phone at the time. It was an actual MP3 player where you had to download stuff. Yeah. I had buzz out loud. There you go. Yeah. Well, interesting, mm -hmm. Father Robert Balasar. Oh, I uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, okay. Um, so you were in D.C. for four years. That's a long enough time to kind of get a sense of of all the things that people travel there to see. Correct. And then to see all sorts of other things. Because you've done a lot of travel with the Jesuit. Um, a little yeah, bit. The Jesuit. Uh, I have done. with the Jesuits. I have now been on every continent. And that includes Antarctica. No kidding. That's I that's mean, amazing. That's too much travel. That's no, that's too much travel. Really, it's too much travel. Prior prior to all this, did you like? Would you say you are a travel? like interested in travel or, is, you know, cause some people right. that would like scare them in their boots. They're like, you know what? No, I just want to stay in one place. And other people, that's like the dream. It's I traveled a lot before I entered the society with my family. Yeah. Uh, and then some solo stuff, but not nothing like once I joined the society of Jesus. I mean, I've been sent everywhere, everywhere. And I had a weird history for a while there where the longest assignment I had was like two years. Uh, and even within the two years assignment, I was normally lent out here and there for a special project here, a special project there. Went to Bolivia, went to China, went to the Philippines, went to Vietnam. Uh, and it wasn't until TWIT mm -hmm. that I had an assignment that lasted five years, which was amazing. Interesting. Was, uh, and uh, yeah. the timing of that, too. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So. This is this is one of the I have to imagine one yep. of the things that um, you have had to explain a lot in your career is how you 
a career Jesuit priest mm -hmm. uh, are also, or you know, can continue to be. Uh, I mean, you have you have a lot of fascination and you know background in technology, which we'll talk about. But you also kind of had like a full time podcast host gig there for a while. I did, and I imagine a lot of people probably ask you like. How do those two things line up? Like, isn't being a Jesuit priest a full-time job? Like, how do they both exist at the same time? Okay, you have to remember that at that time, I was much healthier than I am right now. I was much slimmer <laughs> than I am right now. And uh, I didn't sleep I, I think at all. If I slept four hours during the night, that was... I was like, that was a long, long nap. Seriously? It was. It, wow. It, that's no longer the case. Now, if I try to do that after the second week, I'm destroyed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, well, yeah. time comes for all of us. It does. And it's as we get older, those, those kinds of things, they are not as easy as they once were. Actually, the one that did it for me was um, tanning. So when I was up to my 30s, I could stay out as long as I wanted in the sun. No sunblock, no nothing, no protection. Mm -hmm. And I would get dark. I would never burn. I would just get darker and darker and darker. Were you wearing SPF or anything? Nothing. Like that? Really? Nothing. Okay. But then 30 came and suddenly, <laughs> it, like if I'm out in the sun for 15 minutes too yeah. long and suddenly I come back, I'm like, this this is a sunburn. This is what a sunburn this feels like. What, yeah, they're no good. Yeah. No, yeah. but okay. So back to that. How How is that possible? Um, I had so much energy and mm. I had so many interests and so many hobbies uh, that... I kind of just did everything. So I I did my work for the Society of Jesus. Mm. Uh, I was a priest. I was a minister. I was a confessor. I was a uh, a man who worked with uh, young adults trying to give them uh, guidance and spiritual direction. So I did all the things that you would expect a priest to do, and that took a quarter of my day. So I needed to do something else with some of that time because I had all this energy. I had to burn off. Yeah. So I started looking at podcasting. Um, it, w it was brand new. No one was really doing it. It was, wasn't even really a thing. We didn't call it podcasting. It was just me getting sharing in front audio of a files. Online. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, no, it was me finding an old camera, fixing it and going, okay, well, let's what record do I something. Do with this? Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure you have this experience too, but I look back at some of the very, I still have the source files for all those, those early episodes. I look at it and I go, and I'm embarrassed. I'm like, oh my God, that's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> it's hard. Oh, I know exactly what you mean. It took me years to get used to seeing myself yeah. on a screen and probably it took me much longer to get used to hearing my voice because there's something about the fact yeah. like in, in podcasting, um, you know, we're talking into a microphone and on the other side of that, through the speaker or the headphone or whatever, we're hearing ourselves probably the way other people hear us. But when we're talking, when I'm talking right now, I'm hearing myself yeah. through the rattled brain, you know, the brain makeup and the sound mm -hmm. vibrating. So what mm -hmm. I hear of my voice is very different from what I hear through a speaker or a, a headphone. That, yeah, that's unsettling. It that takes a really long time for people to get over. You know, the, the funny thing is we both have had haters at one point or another. Never. Now, yes. I know. On yes. the internet? No. <laughs> God, the internet. God forbid. Uh. But, but it, you know, when they think they're hurting you by pointing out something they don't like yeah. about your voice or your style, and you're like, I, I know all these things because yeah. I see it every time I edit my videos. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> it's like, I, why did I say that? Or why did I have that? That's, that's the wrong pronunciation. Uh, but okay, so getting back to it. Um, so I'm, I'm doing this thing. And I remember I, YouTube was still relatively new and, uh -huh. and it was mostly used to, to piss off Viacom because everyone was uploading their content. Uh, and I started uploading and 10 views, mm -hmm. 20 views. I think episode six had like a hundred views. And I was like, Oh, and so what was the name of the podcast. It was point? called the, the... Uh, gadgets. Just, just gadgets. Oh, no, no gadget, 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 gadget. Uh, but not G D G T. No, 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 okay. no, no, no. It was G A D G E T. It was it's yeah. actually, uh, <laughs> actually yours came after I should have sued you. No, no but, um, and then I hit, I think it was like episode 25. And this was my first experience of the YouTube algorithm. Yeah. Or it must have liked me. And I went from like 100 views, 200 views, 300 views. And suddenly it was 37,000 views. And I was just, what the, what just happened? On a, pod something on a podcast episode uploaded to YouTube right. before YouTube had any sort of like podcast infrastructure. Exactly. They've and only recently really built in. And I wasn't, I had like five followers on Twitter. So that wasn't it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really doing the Facebook thing anymore. And then I thought, okay, this is a fluke. 
And then the next episode got 50,000 and the next episode got a hundred thousand. I'm thinking, okay, this is, this wow. is kind of cool. I mean, and then a great no Yeah. And then suddenly Excellent it numbers. said, Oh, do you want to monetize your account? And I thought, Oh, okay. Let's see what that does. And so that, that first, after the first year where I got my monetization mm -hmm. and the first check that came in was for like 16, $17,000. Are you serious from YouTube? From YouTube. That's amazing. And it was, it was because I found out later because I actually started learning about the black magic that is YouTube optimization. Yeah. Which is, yeah. That it was thing. because um, a lot of the technology that I was reviewing came from enterprise vendors mm. and they pay way more than consumer vendors. Oh, on CPM? Is that what yeah, you're talking about? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So like, wow. and again, that was my first foray into optimization. And I started thinking, wow, there's, okay, there's certain content that they really, really like. Yeah. I may not enjoy doing it, but it yeah, pays is, the bills. <laughs> that is the flip side. Oh, but it. you know nothing about that, right? I don't, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, I've spent a lot of time with technology that I care about and yeah. a lot of time with technology that I don't yeah. really care much about, but... It's just kind of part of the gig, I yeah. suppose. Well, I mean, and, and part of that is also you recognize just because I don't like it doesn't mean it's not important tech. Oh, for sure. And 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 like enterprise stuff. I I have a soft spot for enterprise hardware. It's kind of where I came from. Uh, and it just happened that that was a very, very profitable sector of yes. podcasting. Yeah. And that continued into Twit. Right. Yeah. Uh, continues continues to be a, a pretty you know, lucrative you know, right. B2B, all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. There's mm -hmm. definitely a lot of money there. So, okay. So that, but all this YouTube stuff was happening prior to joining Twit, right? Oh, wait, uh, I started this that was like in 2009. No, no, two, like 2004. Well, no, 2003 well, was the first one. But that, but that wasn't YouTube because YouTube, I don't think YouTube was around in 2003, right? It, so whatever the first year of YouTube was, okay. that's when I first started. I started Dang. pushing it to YouTube. You're like a YouTube OG. It was, yeah. No, I mean, I've had an account for forever. Yeah, um, no kidding. You know, back when we started with named accounts and then they became anonymous accounts. And then I was able to get a named account once I had enough viewers. It was, mm -hmm. it was very strange. Um, and in fact, I remember I was at YouTube. I was with YouTube before they started checking for people like using bot networks to add views. Oh boy. Yeah. So it, it was, uh, there was one, one episode, I think the third episode that I, I, I got that hit six, uh, six digits. Um, I was just, someone's like, Oh, so you're using a bot network. And I was like, Oh, what? <laughs> I, was like, I need to write this down. I know. I'm like, <laughs> how do I make a bot network? <laughs> how to bot network. <laughs> I was like, Ooh, wow. So I could just, there's a video right there. How to bot network. <laughs> For YouTube, I know. and and yeah, that's again the dark side of the internet. Yeah, but um, always seems to skew that way at some point. But then when I went to uh, to DC, so I went from San Jose, which is where I started doing all this at our parish, uh, Most Holy Trinity in San Jose, mm -hmm. uh, and my primary work was with the youth group. Um, so I was, we had a special house that was for the uh, the young adults of the community, uh, and it just became the place to hang out. Mm -hmm. and we had what a hundred. 100, 200 uh, kids at any time who would be, you know, they'd do their homework there. They'd watch TV. They'd socialize. So it became a really nice place to put your pulse on what was, uh, put your, your thumb on the pulse of what was interesting, what, what mm -hmm. was motivating youth. And that really helped um, because I would get all this stuff into my office and they knew where my office was because it was, it was the, the house over. Mm -hmm. And so I'd get the knock on the door and they say, Hey, can we come in and talk? And I know what that meant. It meant we want to play with the toys you got. <laughs> uh, Show me all the technical, exactly. technological doodads. Well, I got. had a room that was filled with just products waiting to be reviewed. Yeah. And so they'd go in there and that, this, they were the best review team ever because by the time they left, I could just look at, okay, what is left on the table? Yeah. What are the things that they really yeah, like, yeah, were those gravitated are the things towards? Those yeah. are the things that you got to put up. So what are some of your, the, like, some of the the gadgets that you were reviewing at the time that like that let stand out for you. Right. So a lot of NASA's. So b before uh, NASA's became a common thing. Yeah. Um, it, it, this was just as people were really uh, recovering from the Napster era uh, and we were moved into the torrent era. Uh -huh. um, and for them to have a device that would let them have access to everything that they downloaded, like that was a new thing for them. Sure. Um, and back then it was Netgear, Netgear and QNAP. That were the two companies mm -hmm. that would, would send me stuff. And I always had 
love for the companies who would trust someone who I didn't have a name. I didn't have a rep. All they knew was I would send them an example. I said, this is my style. Um, if you like it, maybe send me some stuff so I can review it. Mm -hmm. um, it. Like Gateway, which became Acer, they were the same way. So I have a special love for Gateway. I have special love for Dell. They did the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, aside from the laptops, they always loved laptops. They loved the NASs. But then it was weird tech. Like before the iPod truly took over everything. Oh man. I, I yes. The, the, the pre iPod MP3 player era. Right. That was, that was an interesting time I, where you, as tech, uh, as, as like people who loved tech and could see the direction of things right. at the iPod, <laughs> at the MP3 era, all mm -hmm. that technology was always, you know, kind of the good example of making promises not quite delivering on them. And that's really why the iPad and or the iPod ended up right. doing, you know, doing so well is because it it delivered and then some. Finally. If, if even one of those companies yeah. had delivered on what they had promised, yeah. the iPod not would not have had a market. You know, you had Microsoft, you had Sansa, you had um Sony, uh, you had Panasonic, you had Pioneer, they had all provided something that was supposed to be sort of a standards-based product that you could just download stuff. And and they all had conversion software that sometimes worked and yeah, didn't oh work God. and they wouldn't plug straight just in. Bring yeah. back some bad memories here, Pod, right? right. <laughs> it, 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 but I mean, they loved it. So yeah. I knew that there was something there. Yeah. And at the same time, I now look at the devices that they were interested in and I realized those were all pretty crap. They were, they were pretty not usable. Yeah. But there was that desire. There was that hunger to have it. I, I should have used that For to sure. say this is this is going to be a big consumer. Yeah. In and in, in hindsight is always 2020, yeah. right? Like looking yeah. at that. I do remember my first I wish I could remember the brand of my first MP3 player, but I remember getting it. God, I wish I still had that. Um and I think it had like 200 megs of storage on device storage. What do you megs. do with but, all that storage? But it was like, you know, but of course they sold it on number of songs. Yeah, you know, yeah. you could store 50 songs or whatever the number was. And that was just like amazing to me. It was like, wait a minute. So you're saying like, I can just, you know, because it, at that time, it, for me, it wasn't about storing my entire library. Like that didn't even mm -hmm. cross my mind. Mm -hmm. It was, what are the 50 songs that I want to take with me right now for this thing that I'm going to, that I mm -hmm. need to listen? You know, it was, it was almost like on demand, creating a playlist, moving it over, and that's my playlist for the day or whatever. And man, things got a whole lot easier when you could just put everything on there or load, you know, pull it down from the cloud. Do you remember <laughs> when Sony released their, is it UHD format? UHD format. I mean, I, I vaguely. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it was basically. Format. It's like the freedom of any of your MP3 players, but now with DRM, and it was. Oh, just, that's right. Okay, yes. And it was. It, you're looking at this, going, wait, wait. So the who's this for? Literally, the selling point. The only thing that differentiates you is it's harder for me to get songs into and out of your player. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, that sounds that sounds <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, yeah, sounds good to me. So. um would you say that your passion for technology and your career with the Jesuits is a complementary relationship? Because they're very different. Yeah. It's easy, I would say, for almost anyone from the outside looking in, they seem like two very different things. But like, I'm here in Rome right now with you. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting in your studio. Closet. Which, studio closet. Okay, we'll studio call, closet. We'll hey, yeah. you know what? It's it's bigger than I think my my room, and, and it's got air conditioning. <laughs> it's so got air conditioning. That's what matters. It's which hot it's on a the... day like today is really appreciated. But um, and then you know you're doing a lot of technology stuff for the mm -hmm. church, which I mean that's largely what you do here, right? Correct. Like and and continue to do here. You Correct. you've been now been in Rome for six, six years. years. Yeah. And I remember. And I remember. I think this is I something you, I could oh, I was say. You would forget this, <laughs> but I, but I remember you saying like, "Yeah, I'll probably go for a couple of years, and then uh, you know, somewhere else." And it seemed like every year it was like, "Nope, another year, another year." In my naivete, <laughs> I got the missioning letter from Father General, and it it listed like you know, here are the seventeen things we want you to do, and it was set up a studio, set up a workflow for creating content, uh, you know, beef up our social media press, you know, things that you would expect yeah. from a, a group that was just trying to, trying to catch up in the communications world. And I'm looking at this list going, I don't see this taking me longer than six months. I mean, I do this stuff as a hobby. It's cool. So I yeah. get here and 
immediately that hope is dashed because things move at a different pace in Italy. Uh, you may have noticed. I've noticed. You may have noticed. A little bit, a little bit slower. Bit yep. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a different tempo. Yeah, it's, as a, an American <laughs> stepping into this country, I really, and I knew this kind of stepping in because I'd done a lot of reading and research and everything. But yes, it's you got to intentionally take your foot off the gas a little bit. Here. And, and, yeah, and it's, it's cultural. And if you yeah. try to push forward like an American would push yeah. forward, mm -hmm. you will upset a lot of people, which I did. So yeah. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> uh, but but after the first year, everything on the list was done. Absolutely done. And so crushed I crushed it. I crushed it. I, I, and not only that, we had brought in other Jesuits and they were communications minded. And I was like, OK, so we're training new people. We've got a workflow. We, we know yeah. what this department is for now. So I sat down and I had my talk with Father General after the second year, which is already a year longer than I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, Father General. Uh, in, this is an Italian, by the way. It's a father general. Um, I have completed the mission that you have brought me here for, and I think it's in good hands. We can turn this over to a, a younger generation. Uh, and uh, I, I think maybe it's time for me to go home. All right. I'm done here. Yeah, I'm done here. I'm done so here. What's next? And, and he just looks at me, and he, I, I love this man, Arturo Sosa. He just sort of says, hmm, you should learn more Italian. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <That's a goal>. <laughs> <laughs> okay okay i got it i got it uh and and now i'm, I'm at peace with it uh, yeah i this is where the jesuits need me this is where mm -hmm. the church needs me right now and it is it is i mean it's interesting incredibly work. historical right. to, to be mm -hmm. positioned yeah. here i mean about as historical as it gets right like right. and mind you i've only been in in Rome for four days and you know we've seen as much as we can without beating ourselves into the ground because you can do that very easily here um and yeah it's just like I'm floored at yeah. the history and that's that's actually one of the questions that I have for you being so technology minded you and and also as you've said mm -hmm. living in so many other parts of the world that are maybe on the surface more tech centric like the bay area Without, you know, without question, a very tech centric area, right? Now you're living in one of the oldest cities in existence. Which is not like, tech centric. Well, yeah. What What is the technology experience for someone in your shoes with that kind of perspective living in a city like Rome? Right. That is so historical. <laughs> it is a city of contrasts. So it is exceptionally difficult for me to get gear. Yeah. Oh, I imagine uh, so. And yeah, even if you find a place where you can buy it, it's ridiculously expensive because of all the tariffs. So uh, I probably shouldn't say this on camera, but I'm gonna because you don't know where I am. You can't find me. But a lot of times I just sort of smuggle stuff in. <laughs> no, no, it's not smuggled because it's personally purchased yeah. and I bring it back with me. Mm -hmm. If I was bringing it for resale, that would be smuggling. But right. But I mean, when when you're when you're home. Exactly. You well, buy, and I mean, it's the same thing as if you happen to buy something and, precisely. and want to bring it with you. I mean, it's exactly the same. The camera that I purchased for the green screen studio downstairs, mm -hmm. which was a nice one, um, the per the price of buying it in Italy was more than the price of buying it in the United States and buying a plane ticket to go get it. Jeez. So wow. it, it was just like, oh, that's a no brainer. Yeah. <laughs> I get a trip home. Woohoo. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, but, but when I mean a city of contrast is so it's hard to get gear. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still a lot of people, especially in my organization who don't really understand what we're trying to do. Like something I run into a lot is, uh, if we're, if I'm creating a piece of content, that's not specifically religious. It's not mm -hmm. faith-based. We're not talking about saints. We're not talking about theology. We're talking about tech, or we're t maybe we're talking about politics, or maybe it's just me and another person, and we are just shooting the, the breeze. Mm -hmm. Someone will get upset because they said, well, this, is, this doesn't represent us. And I'm, I'm trying to get them to understand, no, 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 it's, this is like a ministry to young adults. Mm -hmm. This is a ministry of presence. Mm -hmm. If if I get on the air and all I'm doing is talking about how you're all sinners and you're condemned and you have to see the light, which some people want me to say, well, I have an audience of zero. Mm -hmm. um, but if we show them that, look, hey, people of faith have other interests. I love technology. I love art. I love I love traveling sometimes. Then you, you, it's not about proselytizing; it's about mm -hmm. building a relationship. Mm -hmm. and, and this is this has been my ministry for many, many years, even before the internet stuff. When I work mostly with young adults, 
It's about getting them to trust you in the small things so that they'll trust you in the large things. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's it's a very important lesson. I mean, that's, you, parents do the same thing. It, it's it's this idea of I need to show you that I can be interested in you. I need to show you that I have some of the same interests as you, um, and I also have to show you that I am a non-judgmental person and I'm ready for a conversation at any time. That's basically what my ministry is. Yeah. So there's that. On the other side, here, right here is the fastest internet connection I've ever had in my life. And I live in the San Francisco. In this I, room you're talking in, about? In this room. I, I Right now, if I wanted to, I have access to three 10 gig lines, 10, wow. to th 10 gig fiber lines from three different carriers. Now, did you have that prior to your involvement? Was that here? That or, was here. Or, well, okay. or is this something that there you was were one involved here. in bringing? Yeah, in? There, there was one here and then two found their way <laughs> uh, and you know, like uh cloudflare gives us all the protection from ddos that we need mm -hmm. um I i've got vendors who come in because they'd like to be working in rome for mm -hmm. you know for security uh, so at the same time that it's kind of i don't want to say anti-tech this is not a luddite city mm -hmm. but it is a city that moves very slowly Mm -hmm. And for a city that moves very slowly to also have some of the things that people in tech cities would love to have, that's weird. That's that's weird. And it's kind of wonderful. Yeah. 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 It's a big contrast. Um, going to take a quick break and then we're going to talk about uh, some things that have less to do with uh, where you're at right now and more to do about how you got here. Uh -oh. <laughs> that's coming up in a second. Uh, so this is uh, something I really love about this show because I'm a I'm a big nerd when it comes to technology nostalgia. I oh, love course. like going yes, back yes. in time and reliving my own tech nostalgia. Mm -hmm. So um, so let's talk a little bit about kind of like what oh. nerd what geeks you out. Let's get into that. Kind of led you know into where you are today. Is there from when you were a kid? Well, first of all, how what was the technology environment that you grew up in? Were your parents like supportive? Like were they technology minded or did they just recognize in you? Oh, hey, Robert loves his tech. You know, how did that go? My father was an extreme tech head. Extreme oh, really? Extreme tech head. Like mm -hmm. he wanted it all. He had he got the magazine so he could read up and what was new. Yeah. Well, we didn't have the internet back then, so you had to go buy a magazine to find out. But um, and was this in this was in the Silicon Valley. So this was, oh, so this, yeah. okay, you were in Silicon Valley. Okay. In the Silicon Valley is the 70s and the 80s. So mm. it was really the start of everything. Mm -hmm. And my father was right there. Like he, he knew that this was going to be something big. But at the same time, he also understood it wasn't for him. Mm. I, I remember at one point he told me, he said, look, I love this stuff. But by the time it becomes something that everyone's using, uh, it'll be past me. Says, but it's going to be your era, your generation. And he was dead right. Yeah. He was right. absolutely right. So he supported me. My mom, not so much. Uh, so I, I, I don't mean this like, oh, my mom was terrible. I mean, she was a mother and she was concerned that her son was diving through dumpsters. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, she, I mean, I think I saw something about that. Yeah. Dumpster diving, which yeah. I can also say you and I have in common. I had a little right? bit of that in my childhood as well. I mean, <laughs> someone's going to throw out some perfectly good computers or slightly yeah. broken computers. Why yeah. am I not going to take them? I mean, seriously, not, not that we condone you doing that right now. No. But you, you know, you're a grown up. You make your own decisions. Exactly. But yeah, it's really interesting what people throw out. You're just like, wait a minute, but that, that can work. It's, like that works. Especially back in the day, because uh, before everything was miniaturized into a single chip, you mm. could fix things very easily. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, like I remember the very first computer I yeah, fixed true. was things were a little more mechanical. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, cause you could open it up and you're like, oh, well that cap is blown. Oh, right. So yeah, you could get a much better v visibility into everything exactly, prior to exactly. you know, being shrunk down to the size of the tip of your finger. And, and so what yeah. would happen is like, uh, so the, uh, the TI 994 a Texas mm -hmm. instruments, 994 a mm -hmm. was the first computer ish thing that I had. And I remember someone had dumped out a bunch of them. Uh, there was like 30 of them in a dumpster. Wow. Because was, they were all broken. Was there a store that was like, was that a Radio Shack or was that a- No, it was a, like a warehouse. It was just a warehouse. Yeah. So I guess it was like a warehouse that had received returns because they weren't working. They they probably just plugged them in just to make sure they weren't working and then they tossed them. That's amazing. And so I had, you know, 25, 26 of these TI-99 4As with the power supply. Um, and of course, none of them worked, but then I started opening them up and I realized, well, that looks burnt. 
So I'm going to desolder it from this board. Yeah, and put it over. you, and you like, had all the supply you needed. Exactly. Oh, that's amazing. And so and, and that that actually that really sparked my the first time Heck it yeah. turned on. That was like, whoa! I made I did that. I did this. Yes. This, yes. I can be proud. Wow. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was smitten. The, from the, and after that, that's when my mom went crazy because she would come into my room every once in a while. She was like, I'm tired of all the throw this away. This is junk. I'm like, no, it's not junk. It's supplies. Well, that was one question that, that popped up in my mind is where did all the, where did all those computers go? So you were just piling them in your room? I mean, everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, uh, with hindsight, my mom was right. I mean, seriously, um, I, I thought she was a pain for making me get rid of stuff. Yeah. But I, I mean, I, it, it was hoarders before hoarders. No, it was all computer stuff, but it was, yeah, I was really, really hoarding stuff because you know how it is with tech people who save every cable they've oh, ever received. Dude, I have, I have, I mean, we all do, right? I have that vat, yeah. that container filled with cords. And even to this day, there's like, like, there's probably like a standard phone yeah. cord in there. Yeah. And I don't, I don't throw away the last one because I'm like, you never know. And, but I'm telling you, that opportunity is probably never going to happen I, again. I but I can't you, throw it away. I guarantee you the moment you throw it away, <laughs> oh, dude, the next it. week, yes. you're going to need it. See, <laughs> that, that, okay, that's that's usually how it goes. Yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, so from, from that early from that early stage of dump, dumpster diving and putting stuff together, um, I solely worked from, okay, I want to make it work to I want to know how it works. Yeah, I understand it. Um, and that took a bit more doing. So I, I was in, I was in grade school, at a place called uh, St. Joseph's, and I started. Go and right next to St. Joseph's, there was a community college. Mm. So I started going to audit uh, electronic engineering courses at the <laughs> community college, and a lot of it went straight over my head when they were doing the mathematics. I was like, I don't get that. But when they were starting to talk about concepts. I was like, oh, okay, that that's what a diode is. That's what a capacitor does. Mm. Oh, okay. Oh, a transformer. This is how it works. And that's the sort of stuff. That's the information I needed to actually open up a computer. And rather than just go, that's burnt, let's replace it to say, okay, so it goes from here to here to here. And right. This does this and that does this. Yeah. Or, or to say, that's burnt. What is the function of that that's burnt? Right. Rather than yeah, just, let's just find another one. wire on that thing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's uh, really cool. How old were you when you were auditing uh, these community college like courses? Eight, I think it was when we and yeah, they would just they they didn't care. They it's didn't community care. college, man. Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> they really didn't care. That's uh, that's really. I, that's I paid. I paid my uh, what was it? Uh, Eleven dollars. Yeah. The time, oh, I know. I yeah. <laughs> Boy, have have times changed as I, far as that's. It kind of tells you what time it was. Eh? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I went to yeah before I went to university for my broadcast degree. I, I started at uh, City College, San Francisco. It was eleven bucks a credit. Yeah. Times have changed. Uh, actually, um, Chris Rock was just here. He visited the Pope uh, with some other comedians, and mm -hmm. he has this great. Uh, line that he said, yeah, community college is like a disco with books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, I can't, I can't say no to that. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. So, okay. So then you were fixing up uh, TRS 80s mm -hmm. and uh, what, what did you do with them once you fixed them up? Uh, so a few I sold. Yeah. Well, th that was what I thought. I was like, man, yeah, you, yeah, can, that you mean, can flip those. That was, that's when I, uh, <laughs> and I didn't tell my mom cause I'm like, no, you, you wanted me to get rid of it. You're not going to share I got this. rid of it yeah. for a price. <laughs> and did, now did you sell them like on a bulletin board system or something like that? BBS, baby. BBS. All right. There we go. <laughs> there was, there was Very a BBS. Uh, I, I ran my own for a while, yeah. but, um, I had one line, so, you know. Well, um, I've been there too. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, what you gonna do? Like, <laughs> okay, I gotta ask this. As the admin, did you ever sit there and just like wait for someone to call in? Oh, yeah. You're like, oh, come on, call. Yes. I want someone to use this thing I just created. Oh, for sure. Yeah, because yeah. that was because that was confirmation. That was some sort of right? assurance that, that mm -hmm. this thing that you created, somebody else had an interest in. Yeah. And that was absolutely, it was magical. The problem for me though, is that I only ran a BBS for a very short period of time okay. because it was, as you said, single line. Mm -hmm. And I lived with my family. You know, I was, what was I in fifth or sixth grade, sixth grade at this point, mm -hmm. at this point. Um, and so I had to convince my parents to, um, that they would, they would allow me to run the BBS that would occupy the phone line if I ran it after 
1030 at night until I woke up, you know, in the morning at like 630 a.m. or whatever. And so it didn't last very long. But but it did, you know, happen for a while. And it really gave me a taste of like because I by that point I had called so many right. BBSs. I knew like what it was like to be on the other side of it. And what I wanted was to create something that people really wanted to call into. And so when exactly. it happened, it was magical. It was such a great feeling. And I, I would love, I mean, I, one of the nice things about being the admin was you could kind of see what they were doing and yeah. like, like, Oh, you'd see them skipping around through they, the experience. They're, they're playing like, the, oh, they're going there now. Yeah, the, the turn-based role-playing <laughs> game. Yeah. They're, they're playing that. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. they're, they're posting a message yes. or they're responding to them. I'm like, Oh, this is great. Yeah. Uh, so cool. I, and I'm convinced that there is a generation that we got our really bad sleeping habits of going late into the, into the night because of, <laughs> That BBS formation. Oh boy. Because I think, no, we all did the same thing, which yeah. is we could only use it. We could only offer it late at night because mm -hmm. otherwise the phone was being used. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, they're, I'm staying up till four in the morning because I want to see who's going to call into the BBS. Yeah. Uh, but there was a BBS called Sandufer, Sandufer Electronics. So it was run by an actual company in, in the Bay Area. And they had a for sale section of their bulletin board. Uh, and so I would just post things at first it was um you know computers that i had fixed but then it started being things like floppy disks i struck it rich with discarded floppy disks so oh by dumpster diving right so um back in the day when floppy disks were actually a thing yeah um you would have these companies that did the duplication for me, Microsoft would come to them and say, there's a new version of Windows, it needs 30 disks, and uh, we need you to make a million copies. So they would have these massive machines that just had like disk loaders, and they would it would just automatically feed and then do a, a fast copy. But they'd have dozens or hundreds of these things so they could make many copies at the same time. Mm -hmm. Well, those machines absolutely hated any defects. So it would load and a the, low kind of very tolerance, tolerance for, for, for errors. So errors. what would happen was it would load it and it would do a, like a quick, a really quick scan. And if it, it found any sectors that it didn't like, it would just kick it. Uh, and so in some of these, some of these scenarios, they were losing 25 to, to 30 percent of their floppy disks. Wow. And the thing is, they weren't bad floppy disks. They were just bad for a duplication machine. Right. So I found dumpsters that were filled with, and they, they had repackaged them into the into the cardboard boxes of thousands of these floppy disks that were probably still good. So what I would do is I would just format. And if it did a full format and it was able to say, okay, yeah, great. it's fine, great. Yeah. And so I got these things for free. And at the time I was selling them for a dollar each, which was crazy cheap for a high density <laughs> floppy disk. It was crazy, crazy cheap. Like people are like, how can you sell these things? <laughs> Uh, but I'm like, well, it's because it's pure profit. I'm just literally just picking these things up. And How can you sell these things, kid? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a nice thing. Don't ask questions. Well, BBS, <laughs> no one knows your age. That's true. Until, until you show up, you're like, hey, thanks. Uh, uh, really there appreciate you go. This. Here's if, your disc. Your discat. If you need some more, sir, I can give you another. <laughs> and, and actually, uh, I had I had a couple where like someone would buy a hundred discs. Uh, which a hundred dollars. Oh, that's a that payday, was a, right? A, yeah, that was a payday. And I'm yeah. like, oh, and, but I had, I had two or three of them that came back after like, yeah, we just wanted to make sure that they were okay. And these were great. Can we get like 10,000 of these? Oh my goodness. And I was like, like, Ooh. yes, you can. Could you? Oh, God. could you supply 10,000? The, I mean, seriously, every night those dumpsters wow. were full. So there were, there were always more than I could take. And and again, my mom, because yeah. the garage started getting stacked. And she's like, stop it. No more. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> and, and remember, you know, at the time, I could only strap like three or four boxes full of these things to my back and bike. Oh, my goodness. So I could do like maybe. So you're not six, doing a paper route. You're no. doing like a disc <laughs> route. Good. My my paper, my uh, digital route paid your, way more than a paper your route. Your paper route was like a magnetic strip it, route. It or was it? paper. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's really impressive. Yeah. Wow, you're you're a total entrepreneur. Uh, and, and also a little bit of a, a profiteer. I mean, yeah. Kind of, yeah, did uh, did technology ever get you into trouble? Or is this a question that I shouldn't ask, but I'm, I'm super curious. Pre, yeah, yeah, we're past the statute of limitations in most of this stuff. You so know what? You're not the only person to say that on this <laughs> exactly. show. I don't think, I don't think they, there's no murder. So yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> I think we're like 40 years. Yeah, we're done with that. Um, I never stole. 
Yeah. I never, ever stole. That was, that was a firm line for me. Um, dumpster diving was different yeah. because I figured, A, well, yeah. if it's, it, yeah. Dep- and depending on who you ask, they would consider that, you know, uh, pushing the boundaries, breaking the law right. or whatever. Or I don't even know if it was breaking the law then. I think maybe now there's more laws in place for, for dumpster diving, but I, I truly yeah. don't know then. But, but I agree. Like, right. Like you're, you're throwing it out. Like, well, and actually the, uh, the owner of the disc duplication company that I used to take discs from. Like after my third or fourth week, uh, I guess one of the security guards was wondering, why is there a kid who keeps going through our dumpsters? And he actually came out and he talked to me one night and he said, hey, look, I'm concerned because I don't want you going through the dumpsters because that's dangerous. Mm. Uh, So if you tell me how many you're going to take, I'll set them aside. I'm like, okay, great. So he would just put the boxes next to the dumpsters and I just, I just grabbed them. That's amazing. So, I mean, that was, it was like, yeah, chill. He, he wants to get rid of them yeah. in his mind. Now I realized back then I just thought he was doing me a solid. Now I realize, oh, well that's more he can put in the dumpster because <laughs> I'm taking, oh. <laughs> I'm taking stuff away. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> Everyone benefits. <laughs> uh, but okay. Um, uh, We'll just say in my early days were also the days when schools were first really starting to put like grades and attendance stuff yeah. into network computers. Yeah. Um, and they had no idea how to do things like security, uh, both physical security or electronic security. So I, I will say at my high school, I, mi- I missed probably a good 60%, 70% more days than than it says on my record, you know, things like that. It's not that bad, but yeah, I should have gotten in trouble for that. Yeah. I always, I always dreamed about that. Like, but, but I didn't quite know how to get there. Like I, I had the, the BBS history. Mm-hmm. I had the, the modem history. I got in trouble in, in other ways. And I think by that point that prevented me from doing that, yeah. but I definitely considered that because I was not the best student in, in junior high and high school. Like I could, I could have definitely done better on the grades department. And I'm sure at the time I was thinking, dang, I wish I could just like, mm-hmm. you know, write it to be different. <laughs> early on, very early on. Um, most of the, the phone system in the United States had already been patched. So it did not respond to the tone yeah. from a whistle. Right. But I found some pay phones that still did. Mm-hmm. And one of them was actually very close to my school, my, my grade school. So, yeah, I if I had paid for that, that'd be thousands of dollars worth of long distance charges. Yeah. Well, and there was also just for, for context, like at the time, like if we're talking bulletin board system era, yeah. there were there was a lot of that information floating around mm-hmm. and it didn't take you that much time to no. encounter it. No. And as a kid, like I can speak from my own personal experience as a kid, that felt like magic that yeah. felt like kind of taking passion around technology and okay, now we're talking like you, you mean this thing I normally would need to pay for a phone call. And now I don't need to pay for a phone call that's because I do this power. whistle. Yeah. I do this tone. Uh, that's magical, you know? And so anyways, well, that's why I, I, I love going to DEF CON because that's mm. the spirit of it. Yeah, it's that's it's like, true. Look, we're not criminals. Well, right. most of us aren't criminals. We're just really <laughs> yeah. curious. Yeah. If, if you I'm fascinated by yeah. the fact that, if These you create something that's publicly accessible, I don't see the service. I see a puzzle. I yeah. want to know how it works. Totally. Um, and, and you know, I have never maliciously damaged anyone's system. Uh, even the people, <laughs> fun story. This is two years ago, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, we had given a group the, uh, a space on a web server, uh, a virtual web server. And they kept, well, we want direct access. And you know, and it's, it was all these things like, this is not a good idea. We want FTP. I'm like, well, we can make secure FTP. No, no, no. We just need FTP. Our application will work with secure FTP. And so I'm firewalling this thing off like crazy. I'm like, okay, well, it's not just a virtual machine. you got your own machine. I don't want your stuff touching any of us. And within like a day, they got owned. They got owned hard. So someone had installed CryptLock software onto the server to try to infect people who were visiting the web server. Hmm. So I bring that down, trash it. um, But then I bring it up in a virtual machine so that they still think that the connection is active. And I spent the next 48 to 72 hours figuring everything out about them. Um, And I was able to track them down to Kerala, India. Uh, I knew their carrier. Hmm. I knew the carrier was very friendly with uh, a couple of shady groups. Uh, I found their building. 
I found access to the network cameras that they had inside of their building. Wow. Um, and I got access to the to the Windows 2000 and uh, Windows NT server <laughs> that they had running all their stuff on. And so I have got root access and I'm thinking, what am I going to do here? What am I going to do here? <laughs> right. And I was thinking, okay, I could send stuff to the police. Or, uh, and I just said, you know what? I don't, I don't really want to do that. I, 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 I dislike what these people do tremendously. Yeah. Um, but I don't want anyone going to prison. So I just deleted everything. <laughs> like mm. deleted everything of theirs, everything of theirs. Oh, okay. Um, okay. But before that happened, I I'd shut them down. I put up a message, uh, you know, just saying knowledge is to be used for good. Yeah. And that went on, on all their machines. Uh, and then just one wow. by one, boop, boop, it's like, boop. it's, Total movie stuff right there. Well, I mean, <laughs> and, and I learned that from YouTube. I, there's a guy on YouTube who does the same thing. And so once once I saw what some of the techniques he was using, I'm like, that's not that hard, actually. Yeah. Because most of these most of these groups are not savvy. Mm. Uh, they they get guys who are getting paid just a little bit above minimum wage, maybe a little bit with commission of the number of people that they scam. Um, but they they're working from scripts, mm -hmm. so they have no idea what they're actually doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so once you get in, it's, it's, you can run around like it's a, it's a playground. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. That's fascinating. Um, that's priestly work, by the way. That's, you know, <laughs> yeah, well, well, and I mean, I should, I should kind of point out because I'm sure there are people that, that maybe don't know enough about kind of the, like the, the life as a Jesuit yeah. priest side of your life, Good of point. your experience lining that up with that side mm -hmm. sometimes if you don't if you don't understand it and i guess this is my way of asking you about it um they can seem to be at odds with each right. other yeah oh I, I totally get that uh and that's because when people think of priest they have a very specific image in mind yeah they think of the guy who is at a church and he says mass and right does, and does baptisms and weddings and funerals uh, and goes back to his rectory, and that's basically it. Mm -hmm. um, and we have those. I, I've done that. I've done that. I worked at Most Holy Trinity in San Jose. I, wor I worked at uh, the Newman Center in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, I do some pastoral ministry here. But where the Jesuits are different from, say, a diocesan priest, and I, I'm in no way putting down what a diocesan priest does. Their jobs are exceptionally hard. But we have a maxim, uh, AMDG, all for the greater glory of God. And, mm -hmm. and it, it's this sort of philosophy that no matter what you have, what talents you have, what resources you can bring to bear, the church can use them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I joined the Jesuits versus another order or a diocesan uh, seminary, because I like this idea of, wait, you're going to take my technology stuff, which I also thought this, this is not useful for a priest. Mm -hmm. uh, and they said, no, no, no. We, we we can use it. Mm -hmm. We we may not know how yet, but we can figure that out with you. And yeah. so, all of this from the time that I started podcasting to doing tech reviews to doing uh, to learning more about network security to Twit mm -hmm. has been an extension of that, which is we will learn how to use your innate gifts and your innate talents to create a better world. Yeah, love that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really great. Um, and that, and that, I think that, it, that embodies kind of what we're talking about here, which is at least what I like about this show, yeah. which is we all have a shared, um, interest and passion in yeah. the world of technology. It's what drives us to do great things and do the things that we, that we do. Um, but man, our stories are just so different and, and they're also the same because the same. I'm like, yeah, you know, dumpster diving. But, sure. I was there. <laughs> You know, the funny thing is um, there are some some guys who I've basically cut off on social media mm -hmm. because they became extremely toxic. Mm -hmm. um, but when we have talks about tech, or when we used to have talks about tech and about our, our upbringing in technology, there were, again, so many of those common elements. Not, not that we grew up the same way, but there was that same passion. That same fire behind that's, it. Exactly. Yeah. The mm -hmm. fire to know, the fire to learn. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking, you know what? If people spent more time focusing on the things that we share, those passions that we share, uh, 
I, I think the world actually would be better. I, I know that's so cliche to say, but we are so caught up right now in everything that's different, everything yeah. that divides us. And, and we amplify it. And I amplify it sometimes. That's, that is a terrible tendency. That's a, a, a terrible thing to do. It's to, hard not to. It's, it's hard not it's to. It's so right? baked into yeah, well, so we are right, right, right now. now we are so obsessed with being right mm -hmm. that we forget that we really just want to be better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I will, I will trade being right for living in a place that I can be proud of, for mm -hmm. doing work that I really believe in for working with people who I think actually care about me more than just uh, the guy who could do X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that, that's, that's sort of my thing. That's, that's what I want to get back to. And honestly, everything I do from the, the pastoral ministry, the campus ministry to the tech ministry, it, it's all aimed at that. Um, so, so to answer your question, how, how can those two things be compatible? They are actually the same thing. If you break it down to why you do it, they are the same thing. I'm just, I just have a, a couple of different tools to get to the same place. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, kind of rounding this out. I always like to kind of have just a random question that has nothing to do with what we talked about so far. Um, and I think right now, uh, what I want to ask you is you are a fan of science fiction. Of course. Yeah. And I think a lot of people who love technology are because science fiction is a really interesting canvas upon which to let our imaginations kind of run wild with mm -hmm. what could be. Mm -hmm. Is there a technology that doesn't exist yet that that you hope to see in your lifetime that you actually think is possible, possibly comes from science fiction? Uh, so often these ideas do come from science fiction, whether they're good ideas or bad ideas, science fiction plants the seed. But is there a technology that you haven't seen yet that you're like, man, someday this is this is going to happen or maybe or maybe it'll happen. And I hope it happens in my lifetime. Absolutely. And, and I know a lot of people right now would focus on AI because AI is the, AI is the easy one to point it's to. Easy, and I'm yeah. not going to say that because for me right now, what people are calling AI is not AI. Yeah, it's not even close to actual AI, but it makes for good marketing mm -hmm. or Apple intelligence. If you're on the Apple side, <laughs> right. whatever, whatever they're calling it. Oh, Apple know. is pretty brilliant for calling it <laughs> Apple intelligence, actually. You know, okay. I Yes. But also if in five years, all the new techies think AI stands for Apple intelligence, the, I will be so thing, upset. That's why. That's why Apple is smart. Even though I don't like it, Apple is smart oh to do that. Oh my gosh. But anyways. Yeah, no, no, but, but there is one that it, it's not, so science fiction, we, we actually do know how to do it. We just don't know how to do it effectively. Um, and it's actually two parts to the technology. First is fusion, fusion, fusion reactions, uh, fusion technology to be able to do it safely and to do it efficiently. In other words, you get more energy out than mm -hmm. you put in. Mm -hmm. We're getting close to that, but we need a second part. And the second part is energy conversion. Um, so right now, the most advanced nuclear plant, the most advanced fusion plant, if we actually had a fusion plant, would operate on principles from the 1800s because they're basically locomotives. Mm. They convert heat into steam. Steam turns a turbine. The turbine does some work, uh, either turns a wheel or turns a generator. So even the most advanced energy sources we have that are, are not renewable, suppose they're not solar or geothermal, are working on these principles that are frankly, it's kind of embarrassing that we're still using it, that we haven't figured out a way to convert heat energy directly into electrical energy. Uh, we have a, a few kind of things like uh, TEC, so th uh, uh, thermoelectronic couplers, um, that you see them in Peltier coolers. So those cheap coolers that you plug into your car and they mm -hmm. keep things kind of cool. That is kind of the technology that we want, but that's extremely inefficient. That's even more inefficient than the old steam engine. Uh, but I'm convinced that with the advancement of some material science, uh, some advancement in how we dope uh, transistors, that we will find a way to very efficiently convert heat into electrical energy. Once we get that and we get a fusion reaction that outputs more energy than it takes to, to, to sustain, um, that's a post-scarcity world. Mm -hmm. That's Big free. Time. That's free energy. Yeah. Uh, and cheap energy and energy that doesn't pollute. 
Um, and I think that because we kind of know how to do it, we just don't know yet what things we need to make it happen. Um, that's something I can see in my lifetime. So when, you know, when people think, oh, I'd like to see shields or transporters. Yeah, that's fun, but I ain't going to see that. And not, not anything like I see in sci-fi. Yeah. Well, but right now, my favorite sci-fi series, and because it has a lot of those technologies that are just futuristic enough to, to let me say, mm-hmm. we, we're going to have that. Um, is a series called The Expanse. I, mm-hmm. I don't. I'm not sure if you read the books or, or watched. Haven't the series. read the books. Um, I I need to watch the show because it keeps coming up. It keeps. Yeah. yeah. I just need to find the time to watch. Yeah, the no, show, I get it. I get it. I get it. <laughs> but but I mean, what I loved about that series is because uh, because now the both the TV series and the book series are are, are done. Um, the technologies that they used in that universe are all doable. From the weapons to the propulsion, again, if we could figure out fusion, right, um, and things they work on the same physics that we have in our universe right now. You know the 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 battle scenes that they have where they're throwing slugs at each other. Like you start thinking, oh yeah, that's actually how things would work in zero g. Or you know, objects in motion continue to stay in motion until they're acted on by an external force. Mm-hmm. You actually see that uh, they actually had physics. Um, PhDs, they had advisors on set and in the special effects room to help them get everything right. And that's the kind of detail that I love as a geek, as a, as a nerd, when someone goes through that much trouble to make sure that there's never a moment where I go, oh, come. Yeah, oh, right. Oh, oh, you're reaching there. Yeah. That, that there's so little suspension yeah. of disbelief that has to take place in that, that universe. I, uh, actually... Um, I interviewed one of the creators of that series for, for Twit for a triangulation. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, what I loved about what he and his co-creator did in the creation of that universe is they had all the lore and like all of the history mapped out before they started writing the story. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I love that. That's like what Tolkien did. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fascinating. All right, fine. Then I'll move it to the top. There of you go. Topic. Okay. See. <laughs> thank you. That's a that's an amazing answer. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for being my friend. Oh, you are an amazing person. Uh, uh, I, I love you, Jason. Yeah, I love you too. I've really enjoyed uh, my opportunities to work with you throughout the years, and it's always you know at, at Twit we worked very closely together, mm-hmm. and then since you've been here, you know it's it's been more of the online kind of virtual thing. Which is what makes this moment really special for yeah. me, because who would have guessed? I certainly didn't have it on my, you know, on my uh, crystal ball that I would be in Rome, sitting in your studio, talking to you about your awesomeness. So well, <laughs> I, I'll tell you this: How about when, in, in like ten years, when your girls have gone off to college? Yeah, um, I'll probably still be here, uh, <laughs> and so you and and Stacy can come and just spend a week. There we go. Just just enjoy Rome. Yeah, Love in, in in April. Not June. Yeah, maybe a couple of months earlier, but still, so far it's been great. Yeah. But yeah. Um, what do you? Where do you want to point people to uh, as like a final thing? Like, it, yeah. Uh, actually, right now the project that I've been working on for a while is called uh, the Jesuit Pilgrimage app, and it's Jesuit J E S U I T dot uh, Jesuit Pilgrimage P I L G R uh, a Pilgrimage. <laughs> that, not, I'm not gonna misspell it. Don't worry, I'll put it on Jesuit the Jesuit Pilgrimage dot app uh, and it was just a, it's a little project that we've been working on here at the Korea for for a while it just started as a what if we had an app where people who are interested in the society could actually use it at our historical sites mm-hmm. um, you want to see the sites you want to hear narration in fact you might hear a couple of familiar voices during the narration uh, of the story of Ignatius and how this whole thing started this this yeah. order that I'm a, I'm a part of which is just a couple feet away from St. Peter's how did it end up here uh, and the app kind of explains it. So yeah, yeah. that's amazing. Um, I will just say, like, I I got to be inside of St. Peter's yesterday. Is that a great place? And it was just, I mean, it's just everything here is so rich and full of history, and the scale is yeah. just enormous. And everywhere, I mean, it's just it's so much to take in. And at St. Peter's was a prime example of that. It was just it was enormous and beautiful yeah. and St. So Peter's, historical. the Colosseum, they both have that that thing where if you see it from a distance, you think 
Yeah, it's big, but I mean, it's not like big. I, well, yeah. So I told you this and it's the reverse way of thinking. It's like, it's like being in Vegas and you look at the thing and you go, oh, I can walk to that. And then like 45 minutes later, you're still walking. You're like, oh, it's just because it's huge. And, uh, you know, that's obviously the reverse way of thinking because things in Vegas are meant to look like Rome. Mm -hmm. Uh, but anyways, yeah, it's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you for the invite to, uh, to come here. You've been a wonderful host and, uh, uh, thanks for being on Tech Exploder. I love I, you, man. I uh, I will count myself as Tech Exploded. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all right. Huge, and I mean huge, thank you to our guest and just all around awesome guy, Father Robert Balasser, and for letting me piggyback off his tech setup for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, we could not do this podcast without your direct support. And really, the most direct way to support us right now is at our Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Jason Howell, like many other fellow patrons have. You get ad-free shows, you get early access to some videos, a Discord community, and exclusive patrons-only pre-premiere live stream every week that happens before this show airs and more. And you can also be an executive producer like Jeffrey Maracini, John Cuny, Katie Lake, and Bill Rudder. Some amazing people really helping us out and enabling this show to continue. So thank you for your support. Texploder podcast premieres every Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern on the Texploder YouTube channel. The audio podcast publishes to the feeds later that day, so if you're subscribed, you're not going to miss it. And please don't forget to like, rate, review, subscribe, wherever you happen to be. It really helps us out. And you can find everything you need to know about this show at texploder.com. Thanks again to our guest, Father Robert Balasser. Thanks to you for watching and listening. I'm Jason Howell. I'll see you next time on another episode of the Texploder Podcast. Podcast.